Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is Environmental Science Video 2. It's on environmental systems. Understanding what a system is and how it works can allow us to tackle really hard some of the worst environmental problems that we've ever had. A good example would be the Aral Sea. And so it sits on the border of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and it used to be the fourth largest lake on the planet. And so the Soviet Union was irrigating off the Aral Sea to grow cotton and rice, and it wasn't super efficient irrigation. And so if you watch what happened to the Aral C from 89 until 2014, it essentially became a desert. And so we just see the South Aral Sea on the western margin. So the fish all died, the fishing died, and so we had economic collapse. And this was a problem with the system. We weren't managing the inputs and the outputs. So the Earth at the largest level is a system. It's separated from its surroundings. And understanding the inputs and the outputs allows us to manage a system. And so the big things we're looking at are the matter and then the energy. The matter to remember is what we're made of. It's the atoms that make us and the rock and the water. And the energy is the ability to do work. Now if we look at the matter on our planet, it is actually a closed system. The amount of matter we have on our planet is conserved. We don't get new matter from space, so we're stuck that the atoms that we have. It's conserved over time. If we look at the energy, however, it's more of an open system. We continue to get energy coming from the sun and we lose that energy as heat. And so the thing about matter you should understand is that it's conserved and this has huge ramifications if we're looking for example for minerals you can't just grow minerals the amount of minerals we have on our planet are finite and we have to go find those minerals if we're looking at energy understanding the laws of thermodynamics the first law is essentially the conservation of energy energy can neither be created nor destroyed but the second law is also important and that deals with the amount of useful energy every time we have an interaction when we're converting energy we're losing some of that useful energy. And so understanding how a system works is done through systems analysis. If it doesn't change, we say that system is at steady state or at equilibrium. And we can move it towards steady state using a negative feedback loop or away using a positive feedback loop. And so big picture, a system is simply separated from its surroundings using a boundary. And we would call this a closed system. Like the matter we have on our planet is a closed system. We don't get new matter. We don't lose matter generally to space. If we look at an open system like energy, then there's flow from the surroundings into the system and vice versa. And so matter on our planet is made up of a finite amount of atoms. And atoms are organized on the periodic table. If we look at the simplest atom, hydrogen is going to have one proton and one electron. It's highly reactive. Everything else in this column is also reactive because it has a single valence electron. If we were to go to helium, helium could have two electrons in this first shell and so it has to it's incredibly stable so is everything else right here if we were to grab an important biological atom like carbon it's going to have four valence electrons two on the inside four on the outside so it's kind of the lego block we can build so many complex molecules off of that and these are all through covalent bonds and so if we look at methane for example methane is one carbon four hydrogens we're sharing those electrons around the outside so we have an incredibly stable molecule. And so the atoms we have on our planet are going to differ depending on where we are. So if we're looking at humans, think about this for a second. What are most of the atoms in a human going to be? Well, let's break it down by percent composition. We're mostly made of water. And so it's mostly going to be oxygen and hydrogen. Um, we're built out of carbon. Hydrogen is so low because it has such a small mass. We're also going to have nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus. But in general, we're going to be made by mass of oxygen. If we were to look at the water, so the seawater right here, what's most of that? We could break it up this way. It's mostly going to be oxygen as well. It's mostly made of water. We're also going to have salts like sodium and chloride, but it's mostly made of oxygen and hydrogen. If we look at the rock, what's the rock mostly made up of? Oxygen. Now there's going to be silicon. We're going to have aluminum and iron, but in general, it's oxygen. And if we look at the atmosphere, that's going to be mostly be nitrogen, but we're also going to have a large amount of oxygen there as well and other trace elements. And so the oxygen in the atmosphere can eventually become oxygen in the rock, 
can be oxygen in the water, can be oxygen in you. It has to be recycled because we're not creating new atoms on our planet. Other important parts of this course will be understanding how water is polar and that affects its behavior, understanding pH and buffers, and then finally biological molecules. So if you feel like you don't have a good enough background in these areas, I put videos down below and you could surely watch those. The next thing we should deal with is energy. Energy was first quantified by James Joule using this apparatus. He has a weight that would fall, it would spin paddles inside water, and so you could measure changes in the temperature using a thermometer. We were able to quantify energy, which is the ability to do work. And we measure that, a nod to James Joule, as a joule. Now when you talk about energy, generally you're going to hear things like watts. What's a watt? A watt is going to be a joule per second so it adds time so if you're talking about kilowatts we're measuring the amount of energy that's being used over a given period of time understanding the laws of thermodynamics is incredibly important so if a car moves from here to here it's converting energy. We're not creating energy. We're converting it from one form to another. So where was the energy before it was in that motion of the car? It was in the gasoline. Before then, it was in crude oil. Before then, it was in an ancient rainforest. Before then, it was cut, given off by sunlight and used by that rainforest through photosynthesis. But we're not creating new energy. We can't create or destroy energy. That's the first law of thermodynamics. The second law deals more with systems. So we're going to have input into the system of the car and then we're going to have outputs and if we look at the amount of energy that goes into the car we could think of that gasoline the energy in the gasoline itself we're using some of that energy for the kinetic motion of the car but we're also losing some of that energy in friction and heat and sound and so what the second law of thermodynamics talks to is that at each interaction at each point along that pathway we're losing some of that useful energy. It's eventually becoming heat, which is non-usable on our planet. And so understanding this balance is the area of systems analysis. And this model works well. Think of it as a bathtub that has holes in it. You've got input and then you've got output. And if the amount of input matches the amount of output, then we're at what's called steady state, if we could see that. But what happens if we have an increase in inputs or an increase in outputs? What we can do is we can lose that steady state. And maintaining that is feedback loops. And so if we look at a real system on our planet, a uh, Swiss lake, we would find that the level of the lake is going to be steady state. And in nature, we find that almost all systems in nature are going to be steady state. So they're going to stay at the same level. Well, how do they do that? They do that through feedback loops. And so if you think about it, as we melt the snow, as we increase the amount of water in the lake, the level goes up, we might have more drainage, and that's going to keep the level the same. What else might happen? Since the lake is really large, we're going to have more evaporation off that surface area and the level of the lake is going to go down. Now we have a smaller surface area, there's less evaporation, now the level of the lake is going to go up. So that's a negative feedback loop. We could look at that at the level of the Earth system as well. And so the Earth is being heated. We're increasing greenhouse gases, we're increasing the temperature on our planet. And so there's a negative feedback loop that takes care of that. As we heat up the planet, there's more heat on the planet it, what happens? We lose more of that heat to space. And so that's a negative feedback loop. The problem is that we also have positive feedback loops working on the planet right now. So an example, if we heat up the ocean, what happens? We're getting evaporation off the ocean. That creates water vapor, and water vapor is an incredible greenhouse gas. What does that do? It heats up the earth, which creates more evaporation of water and more global warming. Another example, we could look at this white area up here. So if we have a lot of ice that has a high albedo, it, re it reflects a lot lot of the light back into space. What happens as we start to melt that ice, then there's less albedo, we're absorbing more of that heat, and so we're increasing the temperature. And so did you learn the following? I would pause the video right now and try to fill in the blanks, but I'll show you what it all means. And so we can think of, remember, the Earth as a system. It's got inputs and outputs. We do systems analysis to measure that steady state. Remember, it could be negative or positive feedback loop. Remember the energy is an open system versus a closed system of the matter, so the matter is conserved, and that whole study is called thermodynamics. So hopefully you learned that, and I hope that was helpful.